All right. Welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series, where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass the exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. An intervention plan is developed for a child who hand flaps when excited. The goal is to replace this behavior with a more socially valid way of showing excitement. The analyst decides to use a response blocking technique combined with teaching the child to clap their hands. Over time, the analyst notices a reduction in hand flapping, but an increase in vocal stimming. What should the behavior analyst do to address the vocal stimming while maintaining the reduction in hand flapping? This is an interesting question. It's a long question with a lot of information, so let's understand what it's asking. It's asking about what the analyst needs to do to address the vocal stimming and then maintain the reduction in hand flapping because we have two different things going on here. The first is the analyst wanted to address the hand flapping. They wanted a more socially valid way of excitement. So they developed an intervention and the intervention was successful. There was a reduction in hand flapping following the intervention. However, a new behavior has occurred. There is an increase in vocal stimming. Now, just because we've introduced a new intervention does not mean the vocal stimming was a result of the intervention. When a new behavior occurs and we observe a new behavior, what should be your first instinct? Your first instinct should be assessment. Always, always, always assessment. Vocal stimming is a new behavior that's now increased. This vocal stimming has increased even though our intervention was successful. We can't just say, well, we just need to stop the intervention and the vocal stimming will go down because we're also trying to accomplish the goal of maintaining the reduction in hand flapping. So at first it seems challenging, but it's not. We have this increase in vocal stimming. Assessment should be your first instinct. So let's look at A. Implement a DRI for vocal stimming, a differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior intervention for vocal stimming. Well, we haven't assessed vocal stimming yet. So we can't develop a plan without an assessment. B, modify the original intervention to now address the vocal stimming as well. Again, the original intervention achieved our goal. Hand flapping was reduced. So we don't want to modify an effective intervention because a new behavior has increased. What you're going to notice is a lot of the times behaviors are going to fluctuate up and down. So you're going to reduce one thing, something else is going to occur. You can't just ongoingly modify interventions because other behaviors are changing. Additionally, we still haven't done an assessment. C, utilize a punishment procedure to suppress the new behavior until they determine a new intervention. Well, we definitely don't want to do that. We definitely want to don't want to jump to punishment for a vocal stem just to buy time. So D, conduct a new functional behavior assessment to better understand the vocal stimming. Yes, we need a brand new assessment for this behavior. Our intervention was successful at hand flapping reduction. We have this new emerging increase in vocal stimming. We need a new assessment. So whenever you get a new behavior or an increase in behavior following something else, we have to reassess and figure out how can we address this new change in behavior. A behavior analyst is supervising a technician who is responsible for implementing discrete trial training. During a supervision session, the analyst observes that the technician delivers reinforcement inconsistently and sometimes prompts a child before they can respond independently. The analyst decides to implement a supervision plan that includes modeling, role-playing, and self-monitoring. How should the plan be structured to ensure effective implementation of DTT, including specific steps and measures of progress? Again, long question. We're going to attack the question first. Worst thing you can do on a long question is jump straight to the answer choices. You're going to waste time. You're going to get confused. So let's figure out what is the question asking. It wants to know how can we structure this plan so we can have effective implementation, we can measure progress, and we can have our specific steps needed to improve this technician's ability to serve. Now, this is a personnel management training question. And you notice that in the plan, they include these ideas of modeling, role-playing, and self-monitoring. Modeling and role-playing should be a critical part of 
training when you're training new technicians. Now, self-monitoring is not as ideal as ongoing direct observation, but it is also a way to track progress. So if we're trying to accomplish this idea that we want this technician to better implement discrete trial training, and we want our supervision plan to be effective at the analyst getting better at discrete trial training, and we're going to include modeling, role-playing, and self-monitoring, how should we structure that plan? So it's really a pretty straightforward supervision training question, but with a lot of extra information thrown in. So let's look at A. The analyst should first model the correct procedure, followed by role-playing scenarios with the technician, and then have the technician self-monitor their progress. Good. This is a good order of operations. The analyst models what they want to see done. Don't skip modeling. Too many analysts skip modeling. And if you talk to technicians, many will say they don't get enough modeling. So before you role play what you want to see, you need to model what you want to see. What is the technician supposed to be doing? So model correct procedure, role play, self-monitor. A looks good. We always read all of our answer choices. B, the analyst should start by having the technician self-monitor to get an idea of what the technician is thinking during session, followed by modeling the correct procedure and role play. Well, self-monitoring isn't going to change the behavior. Supervision has already revealed there is an issue. So B is not going to effectively improve services. C, modeling and role play should happen simultaneously to speed up training in order to provide better service quicker. The idea isn't to go as fast as possible. The idea is to be effective. And so if we're just going to model and role play simultaneously just for the sake of speed, that is not effective, good training. You want a training regimen that's going to work. If you spend a lot of extra time training long term and over the long period of service, it's going to pay off. So it's not just about doing it as quick as possible. And indeed, none of these methods are appropriate for improving effectiveness of service delivery. That is incorrect. A is great. You're going to model what you want to see, that correct procedure. You're then going to role play. And then you have the technician self-monitor their progress to see, are we improving? A student was taught to use a visual schedule to transition between activities more smoothly. Initially, the student required verbal prompts to follow the schedule, but now it transitions smoothly by one only referring to the different visual cues. The teacher was able to achieve this by reinforcing in the presence of different discriminative stimuli. What could you describe the teacher's technique as? All right, you can see even I sometimes stumble over questions. You've got a lot of questions on the exam. You're going to be doing a lot of reading. It's why we always spend the times in the questions, understanding what the questions say, because we want to understand what is being asked in the information before we attempt to pick answer choices. So we're trying to figure out what is the teacher's technique and what do we know so far about the teacher and the student? Well, the student was using a visual or is using a visual schedule to transition more smoothly. Initially, they were using verbal prompts, but now they only need visual cues. And the teacher achieved this by reinforcing in the presence of different discriminative stimuli. That there is the key. And many, many times, the question is going to explicitly give you a piece of information that's going to reveal to you the answer. Not always. Sometimes it's going to be a little more challenging. But in this case, the teacher achieved going from verbal prompts to visual cues by reinforcing in the presence of different SDs. So what do we describe that as? Well, A, prompt fading, pretty clearly prompt fading, right? We've gone from verbal prompts to visual cues, and now we're reinforcing in different presences uh, or in the presence of different prompts. What's another way to say prompt fading? Well, that's stimulus transfer control. Stimulus transfer control is a technical sounding term. That's not as hard as it seems. Stimulus transfer control means we're just transferring control from one SD to another. And so by reinforcing in the presence of different SDs, the teacher is transferring control from the verbal prompt to the visual cues. Eventually, they'll transfer control from the visual cues to no prompt and just simply the SD. So this teacher is using prompt fading or stimulus transfer control. They're not using a task analysis. Task analysis has nothing to do with this question. 
Answer choices like task analysis are really just to throw you off the scent and to test, are you fluent? If you're fluent, you know what a task analysis is and you know it has nothing to do with what the teacher's technique is. If you're not fluent, those answer choices that may sound good could lead you down the wrong path. So fluency as always is the most important thing. In this case, teacher tech, the teacher is using prompt fading and stimulus transfer control because those are essentially the same thing. During a group activity, a child completes the first step of a task and then immediately moves to the last step, skipping several intermediate steps in between. The instructor sees the child doing this and decides to help the child through the task by adding prompts after certain steps to ensure all steps are completed sequentially. This teaching strategy is most similar to what? All right, interesting question here. We have some sort of task chain question. We know that because the child is completing tasks or steps in an order. And in this case, this child completed the first step and then moved to the last step, but skipped all steps in between. As a result, what did the instructor do? Well, the instructor went through each task one by one to ensure all steps were completed sequentially, but only at a certain added prompts after certain steps. So if we had, let's say, five steps, let's say the child does one independently, we prompt at two, and we prompt at four, and then we do the whole chain. So essentially the entire chain is being completed with certain prompts thrown in between just on steps that require a prompt. So what is that most similar to? A, backward chaining. Well, this is clearly not backward chaining because we are moving front to back. We're not working on this last step first. What about forward chaining? Now, the reason this isn't forward chaining is because reinforcement is not delivered only once the child completes that first step. The child is allowed to go through the whole sequence, even completing steps in the middle independently. So what we're really doing here is C, total task chaining. We're teaching the whole chain all at once. And we're doing that because the child is capable of doing many of the steps already independently. And then a behavior chain interruption strategy. A behavior chain interruption strategy is exactly what it sounds like. Somewhere in this chain, we're going to interrupt, let's say between two and three, interrupt the child and try to evoke novel new behaviors. We're not doing that here though. We're still teaching. Behavior chain interruption strategy comes after the essential steps in a chain are mastered. So what is happening here? The strategy is most similar to C, total task chaining. As behavior analysts, we are able to terminate or discontinue services under certain conditions. Which of the following conditions is not an acceptable condition to terminate services under? All right. This is a good question because these conditions are pretty explicitly stated in our code. We as behavior analysts need to know when to terminate services and when we are allowed to terminate or discontinue services. Now, the question is a not question. So it's asking about a condition that is not acceptable to terminate services under, meaning most likely at least three of these, right, would be acceptable because one is not acceptable. So A, your technicians are exposed to an unsafe home environment when with the client. Is it acceptable to terminate services for an unsafe environment? Absolutely. B, after several months, stakeholders are still not complying with requested interventions. So it's been a long period of time, several months, and there's no set period of time as far as compliance from stakeholders goes, but if they refuse to comply with what needs to be done to serve the client, you are allowed to discontinue services. C, a parent gets laid off from their job and loses their insurance and funding for services. Now, C is very unfortunate. It's, it's nobody's wish that someone gets laid off and they lose funding. But unfortunately, what we do is considered a business. And if they can't pay for services, you are under no obligation to continue services. Can you do it for free? That's absolutely up to you or your company or whoever you work for. Do you have to? You do not. So which one of these is not an acceptable condition? Well, A, B, and C are all acceptable. So the best answer here is going to be D, none of the above. Thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. 
When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.